Hey guys, before I get into the message, I just want to say I'll, I will be talking about a comment we got concerning our Ezekiel 38 war video. You know, that was the one that was blocked and now released. But the question was asking, asking about the walled villages and we're saying that and they were saying that right now Israel has hundreds of miles of walls that have bars and gates. So wouldn't this Ezekiel 38-39 war have to come after their walls are down at a later time than in the immediate future? Well, first of all, that's an awesome question. Guys, don't go anywhere because I'm going to share with you my response and what I believe about this question after this, after this message towards the end of the video. But anyway, guys, I'm all the time hearing people combine discipleship with salvation, meaning you have to have works to hang on to your salvation. Works has nothing to do with salvation. In essence, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, it's saying that God saved us by his grace when we believed. And we can't take credit for this because it is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Guys, there's nothing we can do to, to get saved to begin with. It's all God. Just know that we are God's workmanship. When God created us anew in Christ Jesus, we became God's workmanship, which also uh, can be rendered as masterpiece, or as I like to say it, we are God's master's peace. Master's peace. So once we are born again, then we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. But like I said, the good things we start doing for God has absolutely nothing to do with hanging on to our salvation, but it has everything to do with discipleship. Let me just read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Guys, yes, we are to bear our cross. So let's talk about that. For one thing, there is Jesus' cross, and then there's our cross. Let's talk about what the difference is. In Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Guys, God told Abram to do one thing and that God would do eight things. What God told Abraham to do was not a test of his salvation, but it was a test of his discipleship. It was a test of his discipleship and his love and commitment to follow God. He was to leave everything, the security of his country, relatives, closest family, finances, and home. Only Abraham could do this part. God could not do it for him. Yet the eight blessings God would give to Abraham, Abraham could not do. Only God could. Abraham had to put God above everything, every place, and every person. He was to leave his mother fathers, sisters, brothers, all kin, country, and possessions. And every one of us who know our call and want to pursue, 
pursue a life dedicated to God and the bringing of freedom to others had the same responsibility. Guys, this is the beginning step and test of our calling, our ministry. God places disciples, mature believers, into the ministry. Disciples put God's work above everything and everybody. And guys, this happens in marriage. We we forsake parents. You can read about that in Genesis two twenty four. This also happened with Elisha. He forsook his home, country, and parents. You can read about that in First Kings chapter nineteen, verses nineteen through twenty one. God progressively leads you out of your security zone and then into the security of God. Guys, total dependence on God cannot come without turning loose of total dependence on home, family, friends, and possessions. God wants to be your family, your friend, your provider of all things, and for heaven to be your home country. The further you go with God, the less options you have, but the more peace and contentment you have. Guys, in Matthew 6, it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Guys, let's talk about Jesus' cross and our cross. And what is the difference? In Luke chapter 14, from verses 25 through 27, and verse 33, it says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Guys, Jesus is speaking of your cross. He was speaking of my cross. He wasn't speaking of his cross. This, like Abraham, is not a test of your salvation. It is a test of your and my discipleship. There were many in the crowds following Jesus that were already saved because of his preaching. They were excited to be a part of his crowd. But Jesus does not just want followers feeling popular because you call Jesus your Savior. He wants to be your Lord and soul provider. He wants to be everything in your life. Guys, there are two dedications to Jesus, one at salvation and one at accepting responsibility to become a disciple. Hence, there are two crosses. There is Jesus' cross, and then there's our cross. Jesus' cross is for salvation. Our cross is for discipleship. Without our cross, although we are saved, We cannot be Jesus' disciple if we are not willing to pick it up. I hear all this talk about works. It gets annoying sometimes, but works literally has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with our salvation, but works has everything to do with discipleship and rewards at the Bama seat. Guys, we do not and cannot work our way to heaven but it sure will be awesome at the Bama Seat of Christ. Guys, Jesus' cross was sin, sickness, poverty, and Satan's curses. Our cross is anything standing in our way of serving God. What was on Jesus' cross will never be on ours, such as sin, sickness, and every curse from Satan. What is on our cross was never on his. We cannot bear what he bore on his cross, and he will never bear what is on our cross. Jesus' cross was was our redemption. Our cross is responsibility and accountability to God. Jesus' cross was for the death of sin. 
Our cross is for our flesh to die on. Our cross is not for our salvation. Our cross is something we are free to pick up, free to lay down, or free to never pick up at all. But glory, what always comes after crucifixion is resurrection. Glory to God. Guys, salvation brings eternal freedom, but it is not the only freedom we will experience. The result of paying the cost of discipleship brings another resurrection and another freedom. In John 8, 36, it, it, it just kind of means this is daily freedom. This is what Jesus meant when he said, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I put in parentheses, really free. Guys, God's challenge to Abraham is faced every day by every new convert. In fact, it's faced every day, no matter how long you've been a Christian. But the rewards of accepting the challenge have not changed. What God did for Abraham, he will do for us. Remember, God was testing God, uh, Abraham's discipleship. In Mark 10, verses 29 and 30, it says, So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. I put emphasis on the with persecution, guys. As disciples, we will have new friends and a new family. Fear not. Jesus said our new families are those who do the will of the Father, meaning other disciples of Jesus. Matthew chapter 12, verses 48 through 50 says, but he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Guys, remember when I was talking about ministry. We all have a ministry. Now, you may not, you know, you may not have a pulpit ministry, but you have a ministry. We are to be witnesses for Christ, guys. You know, God may call someone back to the city they left, or maybe not. Even if they were in a pulpit ministry, being open to the Holy Spirit for their location is very important, and that's the same for all of us, guys. We must be willing to go wherever God leads. Guys, God wants us to be and remain obedient to his call. That's, that's what discipleship is all about. Abraham was only partially obedient and kept trying to rescue himself before he utterly depended on God. Abraham's blessings could have come quicker with full surrender to the Lord and his plan. After a brief time in Egypt during a famine uh, that you can read about in Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 through 20, Abraham and Lot returned to Canaan. But once they returned, Abraham and Lot's servants were involved in arguments over grazing areas for their large herds of livestock. Abraham and Lot agreed to part ways with Abraham giving Lot First choice of the land. Of course, as we all know, Lot chose the land of the plain of Jordan near Sodom and Gomorrah because of the rich pasture land there. Abraham settled near Hebron. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 13. Lot's choice proved to be a foolish one, though, as the wickedness of Sodom was very great. You can read about that in Genesis 13, 13. The grass was greener near Sodom, but guys, we all know or should know that 
greener is not always better. Then came an alliance of four kings that attacked Sodom, and, and Lot and many others were taken captive. Upon hearing the news, Abraham led a force of 318 men to rescue Lot. As Abraham returned victoriously from the battle, he gave a tenth of the spoils to a priest named Melchizedek that you can read about in Genesis, Genesis chapter 14. God then renewed God then renewed his covenant with Abraham, Genesis 15, which included the promise of a son, and he eventually saw the fulfillment. Guys, remember when we read earlier, just a while ago from Genesis 12, 1, that said, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. And I also want you to remember what we read from Genesis chapter 12 in verses 4 and 5 that said, So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. And Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran and headed for the land of Canaan. Guys, Abraham was to leave all his father's family, and here we see Abraham was only partially obedient, but disobeyed by taking his nephew Lot with him. But God... But God, guys, Abraham still had a but God moment. God still kept his word for blessing Abraham. It kind of reminds me of Romans chapter 8, verse 28. That says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Glory. Guys, those are shouting words. Uh, we, as believers, should always be so thankful for that verse of Scripture. When we fall down, God picks us back up and reminds us, this is the way, walk ye in it. Isaiah thirty twenty one. Guys, the next eight blessings are based on Abraham's obedience. Someone say that word with me obedience. The next eight blessings are based on Abraham's obedience to one command to leave everything and totally depend on God. But first I just want to remind you of Galatians chapter 3 and verses 26 through 29 that says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Guys, I don't know about you, but that's a wow moment for me. Since we belong to Christ, we are the true children of Abraham. <laughs> and no, there's no replacement theology, guys. So are the Jews. Guys, you and I are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham also belongs to us. And never forget that. And I just want to talk about God's eight blessings to Abraham. And I also want you to remember that the number eight means new beginnings. Number one would have to be that God told Abraham, I will show you a land. This is more precise leading of the Holy Spirit. Guidance tomorrow is largely based on obedience today. If you wonder why God is not speaking now, go back and check if you are doing what he told you to do last. Continued and increasingly accurate guidance 
is a monopoly for disciples. Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Number two, God told Abraham and said, I will make you a great nation. Guys, God would do something big in Abraham for now and into eternity. Old Testament prophets and New Testament apostles still speak today. Guys, a life totally given to God will leave ripples on the water of time when they die. Meaning that God took something already inside Abraham and brought it out. God produced two races from Abraham, one natural and one spiritual. Israel, by the way, which is God's, which is still God's people. Israel was the natural nation compared to the sands of the earth, read about in Genesis thirteen sixteen, And believers from all times and nations from the spiritual kingdom, kingdom are compared to the stars of heaven. You can read about that in Genesis 15, verse 5. But both kingdoms have continued past Abraham's death. He only saw the beginning of the promise. So did Jesus, and so did David, and so will we. And Hebrews 11.39 says, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. But in the generations that came, they did see, guys. They did see. In uh, number three, God told Abraham and said, I will bless you. For Abraham, this promise was connected to obedience. Some blessings are gifts, but most blessings in the Christian life are rewards for obedience. These blessings will be visibly rewarded to us in heaven at the reward seat of Christ, also known as the judgment seat of Christ, also known as the Bema seat of Christ. Guys, then Abraham had to accept the will of God and walk in it. So do we with the many promised blessings of obedience found in the word of God. Galatians 3.14 says that the blessing of Abraham might, that the blessing of Abraham might, not will, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Guys, if we regard iniquity in our heart, God will not hear us. We might be born again. Guys, discipleship and salvation are two different things. Uh, number four, God told Abraham, I will make your name great. This was Abraham's reputation in the earth as a follower of God. So it is with us. Dignity is restored as reproach is taken and forgotten. God's priorities do not include titles given by men, such as prophet or doctor and etc. Even without earned degrees, God can still make your name great before people. All that he asks of you is simple abandonment to his call and will. Of course, we all know men love titles, saying titles give prestige, power, and help open doors. It's like this, guys. If God cannot open a door, then how would a title? Guys, when God makes your name great, a title is not important. Number five, God told Abraham, I will make you a blessing. Don't try to increase yourself. Abraham was blessed by God to be a blessing, a motive to be a giver of God's blessings made Abraham wealthy. Just like the Bible says, if you give, you shall receive. It's a supernatural law, guys. People rejoice to see Abraham coming. Abraham's motto very well could have been, Lord, yo, Lord, if you are going to bless anyone, bless them through me. I mean, Abraham knew how to do it, guys. And number six, God spoke to Abraham and said, I will bless those who bless you. 
Because the Lord was his Savior and his protector, Abraham would see others blessed who that ble- who had blessed him. To bless Abraham was to bless the Lord. Abraham became a blessing to others. This meant people were blessed to be around Abraham. This is blessings by association. Lot was blessed uh, being with Abraham. Joseph was a blessing to Potiphar. And 1 Corinthians 7, 14 says, the unbelieving husband and the children are blessed by a believing wife and vice versa. Guys, even your employer is blessed to have you there. You bring blessings by showing up and living for Jesus. Number seven, God spoke to Abraham. I will curse those who curse you. The Lord was Abraham's protector. Those who curse the Lord brings a curse on themselves. Those who curse God's people, Israel, as well as God's disciples, bring a curse on themselves. God promised to protect us. We do not have to do it ourselves. When we are attacked, God can defend himself and God will defend us. Guys, just remember, the army that surrounded Elisha is also surrounding us today. When Satan or the world sends a curse at us who are devoted to God, it will not stick. And I want you to listen closely. Proverbs 26, 2 says, Like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. Ah, those are shouting words. I don't care if you have witches cursing you. If you are called by God's name, that curse literally has no power over you. Shrug it off. (laughs) God is God. That curse will just flit around like an old sparrow. It won't alight on you, guys. Guys, there's power even over all evil, over all curses, guys, and never forget that. So don't live life in fear. Guys, number eight. God spoke to Abraham and said, In you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Abraham did not have to live long enough to see the promises entirely fulfilled. His life is an example of faith today to all nations. He is the father of all who believe, not just to the Jew. Our life can be an example and a blessing to others even After we are gone, our life is more than physical. Our reputation, words, and deeds continue to live on. Guys, Jesus bore his cross, and so will we if we are a true disciple of Christ. It has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. There's nothing we can do to add to or take away. It doesn't help us to hang on to our salvation. This is called discipleship. And one day we will be rewarded for it. Guys, glory. Those are shouting words. Me, this is a shouting message. But anyway, that was my message. And I just wanted to get on to the question that had come in about the verse in Ezekiel 38. Uh, verses 10 and 11 where it said that, that God says uh, per- uh, perpetrators think an evil thought and will go to the land of unwalled villages that are at rest that dwell safely or that dwell safely. Uh, guys, they were, they were making mention of the portion of scripture that refers to Israel being without walls, having neither bars nor gates. And, and their question goes on saying that Right now, Israel has hundreds of miles of walls that have bars and gates, so wouldn't this Ezekiel 38-39 war have to come after their walls are down at a later time than in the immediate future? 
Well, guys, here's what I believe concerning the walled villages talked about in Ezekiel 38, verses 10 and 11, and I'm going to add verse 12. In fact, I'm going to read those three verses. It says, um, Thus says the Lord God, On that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Well, guys, my response was something like this. I personally believe the rapture will come first. I believe it will come before the Ezekiel 38 war. I also believe the walls mentioned could mean more than just physical walls. Walls could also be rendered as those nations that protect and are allies with Israel. My point is, after the rapture, Israel's strongest ally, America, will more than likely be in shambles and probably won't even be considered as superpower anymore. And the same goes with all other Israeli allies. Guys, after the rapture, there will be chaos and total confusion. When Israel's enemies see all nations in disarray, they may start thinking now is the time to attack. But just remember, Israel's enemies will certainly more than likely be thinking about Israel's vast oil and gas supply and, and with the whole world in turmoil and disarray, they, they might become concerned for their own energy needs and just decide to take it away from Israel and so on. And then I later added that I, I look at those walls as a metaphor during these end times. Guys because physical walls would be of no help in today's world. In today's world, I believe it's because the nations that are allied with them will be in shambles and disarray, but I truly believe we fly before all of that, or at least we'll go up as it comes down. The world won't even know what hit them after the rapture does occur. Anyway, this is purely for me, and I'm thinking out loud. And, 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 and as I continued thinking, I started thinking that after that flash, and just a flash from the Harpod, so I am almost certain there will be an EMP effect take place that would cause major power grid outages all around the world. It's my thought that this darkened world will begin to see the darkness they have just been left behind in. Guys, I just want to say that's my viewpoint. If you disagree, let's respectfully agree to disagree. But I know we do not have long, and I literally can't wait to go home. Glory, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And if you don't know Jesus, do not waste or delay any more time. Today is the day for salvation. My wife and I will present the ABCs of salvation in just less than a minute after this part of the video is through. Guys, keep watching after that because I'm sure you'll also want to hear the trumpet blast. It's like this, guys. Jesus is coming. And if I could ask a question, it'd be this. Are you ready? I mean, are you rapture ready? Because we fly soon. Guys, keep the faith and keep the fire of God burning. We love you all. And we plan to see you in the clouds at any time. God bless each of you and Maranatha.
Father, heal each one within the sound of our voice, God. Fill them with hope. Fill them with health. Fill them with supernatural strength, O oh God. And if any one of them needs to become born again, save them to the uttermost. Lord, when we are weak and weary, help us to remember from where our hope truly comes. By your grace, keep us from misplacing our faith in worldly things for support. Strengthen us to endure all hardships with confidence, knowing every promise you made will come true. We ask you would rise within each of us and empower us to live better and never bitter. Amen. Be our shalom peace. Keep us within your secret place, high above all turmoils of life. Be God our healer. We ask when we are sick, you would saturate each of us with the healing balm of Gilead, causing us to be free from all pain and sickness. Be God our deliverer and free us from all bondages yes. and evil of this world. We ask you would always restore, renew, and revive each of us all the days of our lives. Yes. Be our strength when we're feeling we cannot go on. Free us from the weight of all worry and fear. Give us rest from the struggles we daily encounter that are wearing us down. We will remember that you, Lord, are with us. You are here. You are powerful. And you are in control. Thank you, Lord, that we can put our hope in you. Because you are our hope. Though the world may be falling apart all around us, we will yet praise your name. We will say of the Lord, he is our refuge and our fortress. Our God will always be our wraparound shield all the days of our lives. You are our Savior. You are our God. Yes. Thank you, Lord, that we can always turn to you and find peace. Be our peace today and always. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. And we will believe by faith that all these things are done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Guys, we can talk a little bit about the gospel that's found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Verse 4 says, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Amen. Guys, those are shouting words. Yes, they are. I'm just going to turn it over to Susie and let her present the ABCs of salvation. Hallelujah. And how many know that salvation is as easy as ABC? Yes, it is. The ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. This is where the godly sorrow leads to genuine repentance for sinning against the righteous God. And there is a change of heart. We change our mind and God changes our hearts and regenerates us from the inside out. Amen. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins yeah. and was buried and that God raised Jesus from the dead. This is trusting with all your heart that Jesus Christ is who he said he yeah. is. Call upon the name of the Lord. In Romans 10, 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and will believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Every single person who has ever lived since Adam will bend their knee and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Amen. 
If you want to become born again today, then say something like this. Lord, you said in your word that if I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, that I would be saved. I confess now that Jesus is my Lord and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. For it is with my heart I believe and am justified, and it is with my mouth that I confess and am saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in you will never be put to shame. You said that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and cleansing me and forgiving all my sins, past, present, and future, and forgiving me eternal life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you have prayed this prayer, you are now a child of God. Amen. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Welcome to the family of God. Amen and amen. Take ye heed, watch and pray for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house, and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, Watch. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. <laughs> 